G'day, I'm Hamish Watson from Christchurch, New Zealand. Welcome to my session at SQL Bits 2020. My session is on test-driven development, deploying your database code safer. Well, that handsome man is gone and is replaced by this guy. Uh, I've been working in IT for quite a fair while. I've been bringing DevOps to databases and the masses since, well, probably for about 20 odd years before DevOps had even had a name. Understanding data and Azure is a company driver. I run my own business here in New Zealand and I help clients both understand their data, embrace DevOps and understand what this whole cloud thing's about. I'm a director at large on the past board. Um, basically, when it comes down to it, I'm a technologist who understands business value. My tagline in pretty much life or anything that I do in my career is basically just to make stuff go. A couple of companies uh, think that I know one or two things about ones, or ones and zeros, uh, which means I'm a Microsoft Data Platform MVP, VMware expert, and a friend of Redgate. Right, what are we going to do today? I'm going to talk about what this whole test-driven development thing is, why we should care as data professionals, and basically a couple of tools that are going to allow you to achieve quality code and more importantly changes in your system. And I'll do a bit of a demo. Also talk about some lessons learned. Right, so here we have a situation. Developer is saying, I've coded the best six known to humankind. The tester is saying, that's not a six, it's a nine. So one of these people is right. Where in fact, in our industry, both of them are wrong. The client actually wanted the G. The developer concentrated on tabs versus spaces as opposed to what they were actually coding for. You know, they might have the most elegant code in the world. And the tester, I love testers. They're basically the insurance policy for clients because they care about what is going on in the system. But they don't always know what exactly they're testing. The acceptance criteria might be wrong. Or they're having to do tests manually. I don't know about you, but when it comes to manual stuff, I'm not very good. So, what's test-driven development? Well, 15 odd years ago, Martin Fowler came up with this uh, definition. It's a technique for building software that guides software development by writing tests. It's been around, you know, 15 odd years. Whereas in fact, it's been around a lot longer than that. You know, it's coming up almost three decades where Kent Beck defined test-driven development as part of extreme programming. Basically, test-driven development is where we have requirements that are defined in agile processes which we then turn into specific test cases. And then we create software or improve software to pass these new tests. It's around about this time where most data professionals say, whoa, wait a second, Hamish. Did you actually say the word agile? Yep, I sure did. It's right there in the definition. And I think, you know, what we have to do as data professionals is kind of play catch up because we're dealing with systems that are developed using Agile principles. Quick uh, rundown on what Agile is because it's important to understand it because there will be a time in, we, in your career where you have to deal with it. Basically, the highest priority is to satisfy the client through early and continuous delivery of value Agile processes harness change for competitive advantage. So none of this, well, it's not broke, so we're not going to touch it, methodology. And we deliver working software frequently, right? So the definition of done is not when you've finished writing your code. It's actually when the software is working. And we have a preference for the shorter time scale. We want to punch things out quicker and faster. And working software, as I mentioned, is the primary measure of progress. And also, we want sustainable development, and we want to maintain a constant pace. So basically, get used to this thing, where we're using um, stories, tasks, whatever, and you know, Jira, Azure DevOps, Team Foundation Server, whatever you use, I don't care. But just get used to where 
what you're writing will be linked to a user requirement or a user story. Let's talk about the old school approach of deploying software. I'm going to use an analogy uh, of buying shoes. I love shoes. I have 28 pairs of shoes. And in the form of developing software, design, right? I want shoe. Code, I buy some shoes off the internet. Test, I get the shoes delivered. They're a size 8. Except I'm a size 10. The shoes don't fit. And yet, when it comes to software, we're quite happy to write all this stuff and then test at the end. Whereas the new school approach is design. I want shoe. Test. How big are my feet? Size 10. I then go and buy size 10 shoes off the internet. A trivial example, but one that's near and dear to my heart, and will hopefully show you the importance of doing test-driven development. So what is it? Well, basically, we write a test for the next bit of functionality you're going to add. We write functional tests until the test passes. Notice I say functional. We then refactor both new and old code to make it well structured. And we continue through these three steps, one test at a time, building up the functionality of the system. And basically, the benefit of this is that we're thinking, you know, thinking about the test first forces us to think about the interface that we're coding against or for. And it basically means that we're thinking about how it'll be used rather than just what we're writing. This life cycle will hopefully show the various ways that we can approach test-driven development. So we write the test first. We write a test that defines the function or improvement that we're doing. And again, this might be uh, related to a use case or user story or user requirements, whatever. And basically, this is a different, differentiating part with thinking about the test even before we write the code. We check the test that fails. And basically, we're doing this because we want to make sure that we don't have any false positives. We're validating that our test harness works. At which point, we get to the, where uh, the test obviously fails, and we write only enough code to satisfy that test. And basically, it's not going to be elegant. Um, we'll, we're going to perfect it and hone it, whatever, in, in a later step. And basically, the only purpose of the written code is to pass the test. We are not to write any code beyond the functionality that the test checks for. And basically, we might actually go back and rewrite the test because we might actually have to refine it and then come back and write some more code. That's okay. But then we get to a point where we now need to feed our code in and run all the tests. And basically, if all the tests succeed, we, we can now be confident that the new code meets not only the test requirements, but it does not break or degrade any existing features. And if they do, the code must be adjusted until we pass. So we iterate through this. Basically, we're going to get to a point where we need to refactor the code. We need to make it a bit more elegant because we were writing some pretty rough stuff at this stage. And because growing code needs to be cleaned up regularly during test and development, duplication has got to be removed. Object classes, modules, variables, and method names need to represent their purpose or use. And we might split out method bodies for both readability and maintainability. And basically, we um, over time, we will update our tests as well because there will be a point where our tests do not match what the system does. And again, the whole point of this, by rerunning the test cases through the refactoring phase, we can be confident again that the process is not altering any existing functionality. How often have you written something here and it's broken something here? Alrighty, why do people love it? Well, it improves quality because automated tests mean that we will reduce the number of defects that we're passing down. It means that we can be more agile. Yes, I said agile again. Because having existing automated tests allow teams to respond more quickly to changing requirements. Again, being agile. 
It reduces risks because having a suite of automated tests reduces the risks when making changes to the code and helps teams respond more quickly to change. And it instills confidence because we now have the confidence we're not breaking things when we change either existing code or we're introducing new code. And, you know, basically it means that we can split out some of our functions, we can make smaller, modular, and more loosely covered components. You might have noticed that I talked a lot about automated tests during that whole spiel, because again, manual tests it kills the enjoyment of anything, and we will often do things not in a good way. So why do people hate test-driven development? They say it's test-driven development for databases is hard. Yeah. It is, I agree. But the most common way I hear that people cannot do test-driven development is because they don't understand how to test in their database to begin with. Or they're too scared to test in their database because they're going to break it. Because often with a database, it's not the persistence that we have. That it's not the state that is important. It's actually how we got to that state. And I've, I've had clients say to me, we don't want to test in UAT because we'll break UAT and it takes two weeks to refresh UAT. What are you going to do? Allow your clients to be your tester? No client ever wants to be a tester. The other argument is, wait a second, I have to learn C Sharp and tooling and all this just to write test? No. You can use T-SQL T or SQL Test or you can even use SQL Server data tools and write in, wait for it, T-SQL. You don't have to learn another language. You can write natively in T-SQL. Writing these tests takes too long. It slows down development. It is true. You're going to spend more time on upfront design and development, but you will spend less time debugging in the long run. No production code is written before the code you'll write passes the tests. And basically, what that means is that we will not be triaging it you know, in our production system that is live, that is affecting a lot of people, we're going to find the bugs and what have you now. It does not slow down development. It makes development better. Setting up reference data takes too long. Yes, it is, if you take, if you do it the wrong way. And again, you we can set up our test data in source control, and we build our databases from source control. They're not these big monolithic, one terabyte databases, they're probably a couple of gig, and we'll seed the data, we'll do the test, and we throw it away. Writing tests for legacy data, uh, code doesn't make business sense. I agree. Don't write hundreds of regression tests, but when an, a bug is identified in the code that, in your system, write a unit test for it. Or if you're changing code you know, to support a new feature or writing code for a new feature, write a unit test for it. And again, working software is a primary measure of success and unit tests will help us achieve that. Lack of knowledge or experience in test-driven development is another reason. Hi, I'm Hamish Watson. Welcome to my session on test-driven development. You're gonna learn a whole heap. So again, why should we care? Things have been changing in software development life cycle and again, we've gotta catch up. Databases are so much harder to deploy than a web app. If you get a web app wrong, just delete the DLLs and put them back on, back in. We can't do that. We have to ensure the sanctity of our data. So it's so important to ensure that our code that affects that data is safe. Source control is harder for databases. It is. But these days, there is so many tools out there that you can use to do to get your database into source control. And we need to test all use cases to minimize breaking stuff, right? The thing is, is that we need to automate our tests. We need a mechanism in which we can automate our tests. And by introducing both unit tests and looking at ways that we can automate those tests, means that we will get a lot of code, a lot better code coverage in our system. And basically, thanks to DevOps, 
We are literally shipping bugs to production faster than we ever have before. So I find that when people embrace DevOps, the key thing that helps them actually achieve the, the fundamental benefits, you know, being able to deploy quicker, reliably, in an automated fashion, and, you know, increasing the user experience is, again, by having testing and embracing automation in that testing. Consider this application developer. This person has all the right skills and everything we want. Um, in the interview, we ask them, hey, do you what unit test frameworks have you used or do you use? And they say, nah, don't really believe in it, mate. You would be a fool to hire this very handsome young man. Consider this database developer. Has all the right things that we want. When it comes to unit testing, what uh, unit testing do you have? I write beautiful stored procs, mate. And we hire them. Probably get them to get a haircut, but, you know, we still hire people. And this is prevalent in our industry that we accept that we don't have to do unit testing. We might do integration testing, maybe. But yeah, unit testing, no. Thing is... This beautiful stored prop. Now, this is a real-life situation. It really, really was a thing of beauty. It was the CEO's monthly report. First business day of the month, CEO run the report and sent the output to the board. However, DBA refused to write a unit test for it. I was talking to the DBR site, introducing unit testing, and said, we should fold this into the database layer. And DBA looked at me and said, mate, I write beautiful stored props. I don't need to write unit tests. Except for the CEO's monthly report, a column was changed as part of Agile development. And uh, that column change meant that on the first business day of the month, after the deploy, because they deployed every um, three weeks, the report didn't go. And there was a level of excitement. Well, we had to work out what was broken and DBA had to quickly fix it. And it's amazing, right? So they had a three-week cadence for their deployments. They deployed to prod that day because CEO said to. And when the dust settled, I said to the DBA, you know what? You would have found that out three weeks ago on your laptop because a unit test would have failed. Or someone else's would have found it. And you would have been able to fix it when you, when you needed to, rather than all the excitement you did. DBA started doing unit testing when I showed them some cool tools, which I'm going to talk about. So. But it gets worse, right? So developers lob over the code. They go, testing's not my problem. It's, that's for testers. I don't do testing. I write elegant code. No, that's the wrong attitude. And I'm, I'm glad that our industry is changing where we just go, that's not my job. It's all about being cross-functional and understanding where we sit in terms of deploying value to our clients, not just ones and zeros. So unit tests. Microsoft has a pretty good old um, definition of it. The primary goal is basically take the smallest amount of testable software, isolate it, and determine whether it behaves what, how we want. There are three A's. Assemble, get things ready, act, run the test, and assert, did it do what I wanted? Or oh, sorry, what I expected. But don't pout. Don't do plain old unit testing. Write the unit test first. And always test the failures first. It means that we eliminate those false positives. And basically, we want to test so that the errors raised are independent. And our tests don't affect or impact other test cases. And we want to fold this up into integration and functional testing and a continuous delivery pipeline, right? That whole shift left thing. The six qualities of our unit tests. They need to have all the info to determine their success or failure. They need to be valid. They need to be complete. They need to be repeatable. And they need to be isolated. And the last and most important thing, in my opinion, is they need to be automated. So basically, we only feed it a start signal in order for it to run to completion. 
And I always say this to people, when would you like to find that failure? At three in the morning on our online production system where everything's on fire and you're probably in a room with the managing director and CEOs, whatever. Or how about at 3 p.m. on your laptop where you're the only one that knows that things have gone wrong? So what can you do? There is SQL Server Data Tools, which is a unit test framework. It's been in Visual Studio since Visual Studio 2010. Um, cool thing, you don't have to write C Sharp. Yeah, you've got to use Visual Studio, but you can write in T-SQL. And it can be run locally or as part of continuous integration build verification, right? So you build, um, feed that into that. So T-SQL T, that's another one. It's open source, means it's free. By the way, SQL Server Data Tools is free as well. Uh, and I guess if you use the community edition of Visual Studio, then that's free as well. But uh, yeah, um, it has the world's shortest URL so that even people like me can remember it. But basically, we write unit tests in T-SQL, but here's the deal and why most DBAs like it. We can run it in SQL Server Management Studio. Uh, the output is just plain text or XML and very similar to NUnit and JUnit, which basically means that we can again integrate it into continuous integration tools which understand you know, all that stuff. Um, the team that write T-SQL T have put in a whole heap of stuff so that we can do a search, so that we can find out did, it re did things happen the way that we th thought they should. Um, it basically uses the ability to use fake tables. This is the same as mock or mocking uh, in application development circles. And again, it means that we can isolate the code um, in uh, transactions, which means that basically it keeps our tests independent. And when we're finished with the test, we just roll back the transaction. So it reduces the cleanup work we might need. We can choose to run some, all, or just one test. We group the tests in their own schema, uh, allowing us to organize our tests and use common setup methods, whatever. Um, does currently require CLR. This is okay for dev in some tests. You would never run T-SQL T uh, in production. Um, there's a whole heap of um, stored procedures that allow us to verify whether or not the expected conditions have occurred, you know, does object exist or, um, you know, does this string appear, whatever. Um, and also, uh, again, we might want to isolate the unit of code or whatever that we're testing, and it's convenient to be able to, again, modify the code being tested uh, using fake objects, and then, again, at the end of the day, um, throw it all away. <laughs> and if we need T-SQL T to be gone, it's the hardest uninstall ever. We just execute that. Alrighty, I've done enough talking. I think it's time to do a demo. Alrighty, here is um, T SQL T, uh, as I mentioned, um, a really uh, difficult. Actually, I'm going to stop. Sorry about this. I'll put that there. All right, you can cut that bit out. All righty. So here we have T SQL T, uh, and again, the world's longest. Uh, <laughs> URL ever. And um, basically, what I want to draw your attention to is this number here. Well, two numbers. One, it's 30, been downloaded 32,000 times. The cool thing is, when I first got onto T SQL T, it was around the 20,000s. And I kind of like to think that I've evangelized, I definitely preach the good stuff about T SQL T. Um, but this other bit, it's 89 kilobytes. And so basically, you click on that, it downloads a zip, um, and uh, basically we, uh, we have a script that we can run, what have you. So, I have a database here. Um, I actually took the example database off the T-SQL T site so that, you know, you can be familiar 
with uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, we've got a couple of functions, a couple of stored procs, uh, and a couple of tables. So what I'm going to do here, this is the um, T SQL T uh, script that is in the zip file. We're just going to execute this. Cool. Um, and hopefully uh, that has done a few things. Now, you'll notice here that, yes, there are a lot more uh, tables, and it has done a few things to our um, stored procs. And yes, this could look noisy, but uh, what it does mean is that, uh, it, again, these are all the asserts that we need. Alrighty, so we're done with that. Okay, now that we've run T SQL T, we can actually run some tests. You'll notice here, we've already got a couple of tests in there, uh, and in fact, these are down here. Uh, these are some existing ones that I've, I've put in. And what we're going to be doing is our test is for this particle accelerator, right? We need to basically test if there are two particles. And if there are, then we will, uh, the experiment, experiment is ready. So again, what we're going to do is we are going to create our test. And so again, you'll notice that uh, in our stored procedures, we have uh, our, our test, which is here. And basically, if we were to run this test, basically, it succeeds because it's actually done nothing. So a test of nothing means that it worked. Now what we're going to do is fill out some more. And what I'm going to do is we are going to alter the procedure. We're going to insert some values and basically check uh, that if the value is one matches our variable of ready. So what we can do is run this. And you'll see here that it's failed because we don't actually get one. Um, we're declaring uh, our bit. And we come back and look at this. Oh, we cannot find accelerate. So that's good. That means that our um, test harness is working. So let's actually create a function. Oh, <laughs> whoops. There we go. Now we can run our test again. And we have expected one, but it was zero because if you look at our stored, uh, sorry, our function, we're just returning zero, so not one. So now actually let's fix it. Run it again. But it's still one. Why was it one? Because we're actually saying. Uh, if the number of particles is greater than two, so that's actually wrong. So what we need to do is actually say equal to, but this is good because that would be a unit test in itself, right? So we need to check the outliers. Done. 
And now what we can do, now that we have passed our test, we can actually run all the tests and ensure that we have success. What does that look like? Um, oh, actually, the last thing I'll do is this. And we're running this in a container, which means that we can start feeding this into, uh, by containerizing, we can actually uh, build out our integration tests, what have you. Now, if we look at Visual Studio, we have um, a stored procedure here, does some things, um, you know, we have some tables, so some tables, as well as um, our stored proc. Basically what we can do is right click create unit tests. This will then create A unit test class but we don't have to worry like we don't have to write in C sharp if we now click down here you'll notice that this is now T SQL and again we have our pretests this is again where we're going to uh, assemble things. So we're deleting from DBO Pharma where first name equals Hamish. We then do the act. We're actually doing uh, the unit test itself and then the assert. Right? So we select from there, did it equal Hamish. And then what we're doing is we're doing. Uh, some row count uh, conditions to ensure that we only have one uh, row. And then it's pretty easy. Um, we can then run all tests. And you'll see here that we're right running our tests. And so that again gives us some confidence when we change anything within our stored proc. Right? If we change anything in here, all we have to do is just run the test again. Cool. Alrighty, let's go back to the presentation. So, as mentioned, we can add T SQL T to continuous integration builds. I mean, I really like T-SQL T because it gives us the ability to write our tests in T-SQL. So we can fold them into Team City. There's a way of running them within Jenkins. If you use Azure DevOps or Team Foundation Server, we can fold it in there as well. But the most important thing is we publish the results. So, some lessons learned. Remember that our tests are small, as should the change that we're doing. We need to keep our tests simple. They need to be independent. And once we have our tests running, combine them into continuous integration. So in the demo where I was running through uh, the various tests, I would then feed those tests into my nightly build so that every time, I, oh sorry, into my build process. So that every time I check in code, it runs through and runs those tests. More importantly, it's, we need to keep testing. We can't just do unit tests. And conversely, we shouldn't just be doing UAT testing. There are various stages of testing that we need to do. 
So we need unit tests down in development and integration testing. We also need to do integration testing, you know, making sure that our system um, endpoints, that the function, functional aspects of our application or database uh, work and feeding those into quality assurance. We need to do a whole heap of acceptance testing and validation of our deployment processes, as well as feeding that up into behavior validation. And I really hope somewhere along the way here, we're doing performance testing. I know that this looks like a lot of tests, and it is. And it could be very hard if you were to do all these manually. But I don't want you to do them manually. I want you to look at automation. The more automation you can do, the more you can scale, the more tests you can do. There are a number of people that have written some awesome documentation, um, blog posts, or references on T-SQL 2. I gotta admit, I am a fan of T-SQL 2. I use SQL Server Data Tools, don't get me wrong, but T-SQL 2 is great because it's written by impassioned people who care about data and it's free, and it's open source, which means that if you know more stuff or you know something that could help, you can contribute to it. Best practices. Tests should be run often. Long-running tests will kill the enjoyment of all this. Keep your test code cleaner than your production code. One of these is gonna keep you employed. I always think of test testing as a way of keeping me gainfully employed because it makes sure that it catches all the bad code that I write. And I write a lot of bad code. Tests are living. They need to be maintained. So, after all this, let's agree on one thing. Because people are very polarized on their opinions on test-driven development, whether or not, you know, it should be done. And whether or not you agree with test driven development, I really don't care. But at least write some unit tests, please. Because a bad way to deliver change is not to do automated testing. So look at automating the testing. Work with your developers, right? So application developers love and know how to do automation. And if you're doing DevOps, one of the Tenants of DevOps is around culture, collaborating with people, having that common goal or just common sense. And so if you don't know how to do the automation, find someone in your company who can. And if they won't help you, it says more about them than you. And if you can find no one, hi, I'm Hamish Watson. <laughs> Start unit testing your database code and your data, please. I've said please twice. So at the end of the day, at least start writing unit tests. It's really easy. There are a number of people that have written blog posts out there. I've written one. Steve Jones writes about it. Even security people like Troy Hunt have written about the importance of unit testing your code. So if a security person under, you know, knows the value of it, why we as data professionals are not doing it, that's wrong. So please do it. I ripped off some images off the internet. Thank you so much to the people who did it. So, at this stage, I would normally do some questions. I'm hanging around for questions. So, uh, yeah, I'm gonna wrap up here um, and I'm sticking around to answer some questions. Please hit me up. Um, I really enjoy it when people either disagree or hopefully agree and just wanna chat about different ways that you can do stuff. So yeah. There are my details. As I said, I have blog post. And look, I just love to make stuff go. And I really want to help you make stuff go too by looking at test-driven development. Thank you so much.